later on, everybody was asking me, you know, you know, we were waiting to see what you would do in the midst of the storm. We were waiting to see what, what you would do. And, and even in the midst of the storm, of, we, we've been, she's been looking at her medical report. She should be dead. There's, there's no logical reason why Faith should be alive today. And uh, I realized that five, six months ago, whatever happened, about five months ago, um, when they told me what, they showed me a picture of what came out of her artery or her, what, I don't, I don't know the medical terms, it was big old honk at the Amen? You know how I can like say that, right? All right. And, you know, I was scared. I was. It was, it was a very trying time. It was a very crazy time. But as we were playing that song, through it all, my eyes are on you. And through it all, as well. I, I just barely got the song. I didn't get it before. You know, no matter what we're going through, no matter what kind of chaos is, is, is going on around us, no matter what kind of storms we're going on, it can be well with our soul. Until when you start to know the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, that's when you get it. Through the storms, through the trials, through through the chaos. I mean, it's utter chaos sometimes walking with God. It's, it's, it's just, man, you don't you don't understand sometimes that it's just crazy. You're trying to do the right thing, and it seems like everybody's coming at you from every angle. And you're like, well, I'm just trying to do the right thing, or I just, how do I do the right thing? What do I do? What do I do? All I said is follow me. Keep your eyes on me. That's not the sermon, but uh, amen. Second Kings chapter five. Have you guys ever heard of Naaman? A little bit. It's one of my favorite favorite stories in the Old Testament. I can relate to it. Naaman the leper. <laughs> Brian's sitting back because he's talking about Syrians. I'm Indian, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so starting in verse 1, it says, Naaman, the commander of the army for the king of Aram, was a great man in his master's sight and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man was a brave warrior. But he had a skin disease. Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Therefore the king of, king of Aram said, go and I will send a letter with you to the king of Israel. So he went and took with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 changes of clothes. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel and read, When this letter comes to you, note that I have sent my servant Naaman for you to cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and asked, Am I God? Killing and giving life, this man expects me to cure a man of his skin disease? Think it over and you will see that he is only picking a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel tore his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me and he will know there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman came to his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be clean. But Naaman got angry and left, saying, I was telling myself, he will surely come out and stand and call on the name of Yahweh his God, and wave his hand over the spot to cure the skin disease. Aren't Havana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and left in a rage. But his servants approached him and said to him, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some, some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more should you do it when he tells you, Wash and be clean? So Naaman went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, according to the command of the man of God. 
Then his skin was restored and became like the skin of a small boy. And he was made. <laughs> then Naaman and his whole company went back to the man of God, stood before him, and declared, I know there is no God in the whole world except in Israel. Therefore, please accept a gift from your servant. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives, I stand before him. I will not accept it. Naaman urged him to, to accept it, but he refused. Naaman responded, If not, please let please let two mule loads of dirt be given to your servant, for your servant will no longer offer a burnt offering or a sacrifice to any other god but Yahweh. However, in a particular matter, may the Lord pardon your servant when my master, the king of Aram, goes into the temple of Rimon to worship, and I at his right hand, as his right hand man, bow in the temple of Rimon. When I bow in the temple of Rimon, may the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. So he said to him, go. Father God, Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, for your word and thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for just pouring out your spirit in, in, into the Bible, pouring your spirit out into us so that we can know you. Lord, I thank you for your son on the cross so that we can have that, that gap bridge so that we can, our sin doesn't get in the way of us, of us communing with you, Lord, so that that grace may abound, Lord. I pray that that you just help us to focus on you and to let some stuff go and, and to hear your voice today. Lord, we love you. We're just eager to hear from you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So Naaman, who was Naaman? It says in verse 1 that he was the commander of the army for the king of Aaron for Syria. Damascus is just north of, of Israel. And uh, he, was, he was the king's right-hand man. He was a a successful guy in, in the world <coughs> he was all powerful he was, he was a pretty powerful dude you know what I mean we can relate to, to us like and he's got a great job you know CEO of Coca-Cola or something you know he's got money he's got he's got all this stuff he's, he's got he's got it all together in this world you know he's got everything he's brave and good and God used him to give him victory to give Syria victory. So, so in, in, the, in the eyes of Syria, he was a, he was a strong and powerful warrior. But he had leprosy. Skin. You guys know what leprosy is? I know. I know. We read a lot about it in the Bible, and, and and today we call it. They call it Hansen's disease. Um, I, I printed this little thing off of Wikipedia, and I know that's not the most reliable source, but I didn't feel like going through all the medical stuff and trying to, trying to sort through this, so this kind of dumped it down to me. It says, uh, leprosy is a chronic infection caused by the bacteria, whatever, whatever. Initially, in infections are without symptoms and to typ typically remain this way for five to as long as 20 years. Symptoms that develop in granulom include granulomas, pan of the nerves, respiratory tract, skin, and eyes. Okay, this may result in a lack of ability to feel pain and thus loss of parts of extremities due to repeated injuries or infections due to unnoticed wounds. Weakness and poor eyesight may be present. So, it's, it's a... Like, <coughs> Necrosis. Your skin just dies and you don't notice things so you, your fingers will just start falling off. Your, your, your nose will fall off. I was going to show some pictures, but it was I mean, he was going through it. You know, he was here, here, he was this powerful, worldly man, you know, the, that God was using this powerful man. You know, he, he was standing firm. He was, God used him to deliver the Syrians in war. He was a strong man, a, a valor man, a brave man. God used. But he had this infection, this disease. He was suffering. This, turn to Leviticus 13. And he, he wasn't a Jewish man, so he, he didn't fall under the Jewish laws. But in Israel, this is kind of describes what's supposed to happen with the leper. 
What's supposed to happen to someone with the, the skin disease? Starting at verse 45, it says, The person inflicted, afflicted with an infectious skin disease is to have his clothes torn and his hair hanging loose. So he's got to make himself look unavailable, unattractive, someone that you don't want to be around. His hair hanging loose, his clothes ripped. I think we've all been, a lot of us have been there before. And he must cover his mouth because it, it spreads through the mouth. And he's got to stay away. And when he's walking through town, he has to walk through town yelling, Unclean! 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 This is a big deal. Leprosy was a huge deal. This, this tormented him. It was a, a painful, it was torturous. You know, it said that he was married. But he was leprous. He, you're not going to get very much physical contact when you're leprous. You're not going to, nobody's going to want to be around you. Because the thing is, they're scared that they're going to get it. Because it, it's very debilitating. Naaman was seeking healing. Say, in verse 2 it says, Aram had gone on raids and brought back from the land of Israel a young girl who served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would go to the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his skin disease. I mean, this wasn't just a small inconvenience in his life. This consumed his life day in and day out. This, this thing consumed his life day in and day out. I'm thinking he was probably pretty desperate. When the girl told him that, I, I, I can picture him getting excited. Hey, there's a possibility of getting healed of this. Hey, hey, I can, I can get away from this and not have to live with this anymore. This would be awesome. You know, I'm thinking that he probably went through all these different avenues. Kind of tried to try a little bit of this. Maybe uh, talk to the magic man over here and got a little potion. Try to drink this and all this stuff because he probably tried everything that he could to get rid of this leprosy. You know what I mean? He's desperate. He wanted healing. He wanted change. It, it, it wasn't just a small inconvenience. It consumed his whole life. <clears throat> what was going on? I'm sure, he tried everything. How many of us have been that desperate to want to change? Been that desperate to want to get out of just more than just a small little inconvenience? It was something that was consuming our life. I know most of us can relate this to addiction. You know, it, it's totally applicable to, to addiction, but there's so many other things that are prevalent in our world. Materialism, you know, materialism can, can overwhelm us so much that that it's a curse. That that all you want to do is to get a little bit of money and you gotta go. You gotta go spend it, you gotta do this, you gotta do that. You rack up credit cards, you do this, do that, you're you're enslaved to it. chased down all kinds of different things to try to, to fix what was going on. I called this program and that program. I tried AA and A. Um, tried to get in here. I had to be clean for this long to do this. And I had to do this to do this. You know, uh, mental health had their ideas of what needed to happen. I needed to take this pill and that pill and that pill. You know, anything to get away from the torment of what was going on. That's what it was. He was desperate. Says, so Naaman went and told his master what the girl from the land of Israel had said. Therefore the king of, king of Aram said, Go and I will send a letter with you to the king of Israel. So he went and took with him 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and about 10 changes of clothes. He wrote this letter. 750 pounds of silver. That's a lot of silver. You know what threw me off? It's tensions of clothes. You know, in their time, changes of clothes were like gold. You know, it wasn't like they just went down to 
Walmart or Ross or wherever you buy clothes at and, and get clothes. It was, you know, cost was expensive, different fibers were expensive. But this is approximately, in our time, four to five million dollars. It was desperate. <coughs> and if, if you're, if you're busting out so much, that much money to change your life, there's some desperation there, isn't there? You know what I think about? Passages Malibu. <laughs> I don't know why I think about this. Because, I don't know, I'm curious, especially about uh, addictive stuff, and about um, different programs. You know how much it costs for a month at Passages Malibu? $80,000. The one that was cured? Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Is it, he's cured on the commercial. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we're not doing drugs now. <laughs> wow. Eighty thousand dollars a month. If you go a little bit inland, you go. If you go to, I think there's another one in Ventura, which is probably about thirty miles from. From Malibu, it's only thirty-two thousand. Yeah. Amen. But if that gives you an idea of how desperate he was to change, he was desperate, willing to cough up four million dollars, four to five million dollars. He wanted change. He wanted something new. Have you ever been to where it doesn't matter? What it costs you, you're going to change. It doesn't matter what it costs you. Have you been that desperate? I know I have. I know I was that desperate a while back. And, and it didn't matter what I had to do. It didn't matter what, what God wanted me to do. I needed help. I needed to change because the way my life was going, it wasn't going to work. You know, Naaman, and Naaman was a good guy. I mean, he was, he was a leader. He was a valiant warrior. I wasn't any of that. I wasn't valiant, I wasn't a good guy, I wasn't someone you wanted to be around, but I was desperate enough to want change, like Naaman did. Amen. Naaman was desperate to want change. So he sent this letter down, and I, can, I should have wrote down the, the name of the king of Israel, but I'm not really hitting too much on this. He wasn't following God, so when he got this letter, he wasn't really in close contact with Elisha, so he thought this was a threat. He thought that he was being threatened and all this stuff. And, and But that's, that's besides the point. You know, Elisha stepped in and said, hey, send him to me and we'll, and we'll get this taken care of. And then he's going to know. So in verse 8 it says, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel tore his clothes, he sent a message to the king. Why have you torn your clothes? Have him come to me and he will know there's a prophet in Israel. So Naaman <coughs> came with his horses and chariots and stood at the door of Elisha's house. Then Elisha sent him a messenger who said, Go wash seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored. Naaman had some expectations. You know, Naaman was a valiant warrior. He was coming with horses and chariots. You know, he was a leper, but I mean... He was coming, he was rolling. You know, he wasn't coming in weak, he wasn't coming in, you know, humble or anything like that. He wanted Elisha to know who was coming. So, you know, naturally, since he's the man that he is, Elisha should have rolled out the red carpet for him. And uh, come and get what he wanted. Some of you might get this reference. But he wanted this activity about me too. Wave a little magic wand. Abracadabra. Alakazam. Da 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 da. You're healed. That's what he wanted. But Elisha didn't even come to her. He sent someone. Hey, here, just go out and go wash in the Jordan seven times. What? Wash in the Jordan seven times? Dude, the, we got rivers over there. We got, I mean, we got clean rivers in Damascus. Have you guys ever seen any picture of the Jordan River? It's nasty. It really is. And it's not like a mighty river. You know, at first I always thought, you know, 
you know, like St. John's is big, you know, this huge, this big river, the Amazon's enormous, the Nile River, Mississippi River, these, norm, these rivers are huge. The Jordan River is like this, Nassau River right here is bigger than the Jordan River. It's just this little tiny river that's dirty. And so watch our name was thinking, you don't want me to go get in this? <laughs> Man, we got clean rivers in Damascus. We have nice, big, flowing rivers in Damascus. He was pissed. He had expectations. Do you guys ever have expectations of things? When things don't go the way that you think they're supposed to go, you get pissed, huh? He had expectations of how God worked. You know? we, we get that, too. You know, I walk into set three and yeah. First thing I ever says, where's the seat? <laughs> my, my first experience was a ranch. Where's the chicken? Where's the cow? Nowhere to be seen. Not on the plate, not in the yard. <laughs> we have expectations of, of, of the way God works and the way God's people work, don't we? You know, oh, 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 you're a pastor, you're not supposed to talk like that. How many times I heard that? <laughs> I hear that a lot, actually. <laughs> we have an idea of how God's people are supposed to be. We have this idea of how God's supposed to work. And then when He doesn't work the way that we want Him to work, or the way that He thinks we should work, we get pissed. And we don't understand. We don't want to deal with it. We get, we get pissed off. You know, we want to walk into set free. Get a couple days of sleep. Do a couple Bible studies. Oh, I'm healed. I don't want to do drugs right now. I'm ready to go. All right. Give my phone back and we go. I'm healed. We laugh, but all the guys thought of this. Always crouching at the door. That desire to go back is always there. 
But you know what? We learn to make different choices. We learn to, to dip in the Jordan seven times. We learn to, to put those things back. You know, Naaman was an important guy. And Elisha didn't even come to the door. He was, he was insulted. Elisha didn't even bother to come to the door because don't you know who he is? I'm special. I'm different. A lot, of, a lot of times we come into set free thinking that we're somebody, that we're somebody special and that, that we should be catered to and that, that set free should turn. <laughs> God's got his way of doing things. He wanted the magic wand, the bibbidi bop the boo the, the alakazam, abracadabra, da 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 you're all healed. It's like we do. We, 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 want, we want that instant, instant gratification. But you know what God wanted? God wanted Naaman, Naaman to humble himself. And to obey. He wanted Naaman to put Naaman so highly of himself and to lower himself. God wasn't healing Naaman for Naaman's sake. God was healing Naaman for his glory. It wasn't about Naaman. Naaman's pissed. Aren't the Abana and far, 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 far river, the rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and left in a rage. I mean, he wasn't just a little upset. He was pissed. Because he had these expectations. We get upset when our expectations are not met. You know, we get upset when our expectations are not met. You know, we expect our spouses to be a certain way, and then when they're not, we get pissed off and we split, right? When we, we get upset when our jobs, our bosses don't act up to our expectations. So what do we do? We get pissed and we quit. We uh, expect all our friends to act this way, and we have these expectations of them. And when they don't hold up to our expectations, we quit. You know, one of the biggest destroyers of ourselves is our expectations. We want to humble ourselves. We want to change everybody else and change everything else. How do you expect God to work in your life? Do you expect it to be a set free for 90 days and then magically don't ever have to struggle or don't ever have to do worry about anything again? If that's what you're expecting, you're expecting the wrong thing. Your expectation, your bubble's going to get burst. It's going to hurt. I want, now don't get me wrong, I want every single one of you guys to make it. Every one of you guys to make it. But the reality of it is, how many people have ever been in another program? I have. Who hasn't? That's probably neither, but who hasn't been to another program? It takes walking this out. It takes living the life. But verse 13, there was a voice of reason. His servant approached and said to him, My father... If the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Right? If, if they tell us, oh, you're going to be in charge of uh, the kitchen, you're going to be in charge of, of doing this, then I want to stay. You know, we're, we're willing to, to follow God as long as we get to be in charge of something. As long as we're, we're, we're the man for this and we're, we're the man for that. You know, I'll stick around, I'll follow God if, if I'm in control. Not really God. You know, I have a problem serving and set free for a year if I'm going to run this crew or if I'm going to run that crew. Or uh, if I want, if, if we're going to do this thing, we're going to, if I'm going to follow God, we're going to do this my way. Right? That's what we want to do. We want to adjust everything to, to suit our needs.
Brian think he is? You know, if you want change, then you learn to, to, to be in the circumstance that God gives you. If you want a new life, and 95% and of the people who come, they say God sent them there. God brought me here. God did this. But the moment that it gets a little uncomfortable, we want to run away. I don't want to go dip in the toilet. I can't clean toilets. I can't do this. I'm not that desperate. I got money. I don't have to be here. We want God. We want to come and we want to do big things. We want to be get all this glory. We want to be big, mighty, valuable warriors. When God asks us to humble ourselves and to make ourselves lower. You know, we're good with the call if, if that call of our life is to be a pastor or that call is to be an evangelist or that call is to be a, a worship leader or that call is to... to lead hundreds of be Billy Graham or to be, you know, this huge televangelist or, or to pastor this mega church, right? We're all good with that. Yeah. But what if God just wants you to serve for a while? <laughs> what if God wants you to, to just serve someone?
that's not about what you were doing before. But in order to, to be healed, in order to walk it out, it's not, a, it's not a magic wand kind of healing. It's not a, this big impact healing. It's, it's not this huge thing that, that just, thing. it's about walking out day by day. Walking out your calling day by day. Humbling yourself day by day. It's a walk of endurance. Paul said so many times to endure to the end. To endure this, to endure that. It wasn't about a cush life for us. That's not what's going to heal us. That's not what's going to change. It's going to change us for us to learn to humble ourselves and to walk out God's commands. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And to love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. To walk out those. Name and obey. Said, All right. There was a voice for reason. You know, hey, it'd be good if you would, if they would have told you to do something huge, man, and it would have changed your life. You would have been cool with it. Just go and wash in the Jordan. It's, it's, it's about obedience. It, it's not. A, it wasn't about the Jordan. It wasn't about dipping seven times. It was about Naaman's part, humbling. It was about Naaman submitting himself to God because that's what was a, that was what matters. <coughs> It's not about what you can do for God, but it's about what you're doing under God. It's not about doing, changing hundreds and hundreds and thousands of lives. It's about only listening to what God has to do right now. It doesn't matter what's going to happen six years down the road. It doesn't matter what's going to happen. What are you doing today? How are you humbling yourself today? And this is a hard lesson. I, man, you know, I learned this lesson the hard way. And it hurt bad. You know, I, I was willing to follow God, but I was going to do it the way I wanted to do it. And I was going to, uh, my call was going to be exactly what I wanted to do. And <coughs> the town that I wanted to be, I was going to start a church and I was going to be, there was going to be 400 people that everybody was going to tithe at least $200 a week. And it was going to be awesome. It was going to be great. It's not the way it is. I'm 3,000 miles away from my client. It's so much better here because this is where God has me. So much better where God has me. Because he washed the Jordan seven times according to the command of the man of God. You hear that? He did exactly what he was told to do. He obeyed to a T. He went and he did it seven times in the Jordan, according to the command of the man of God. Then, his skin was restored. Then, he was healed. Then, his life changed. Then, he didn't want to get high again. <coughs> then, his marriage was restored. Then, his life was healed. Amen. From obeying. Amen. It's not about a magic wand. It's not about an instant thing. Man, and it's so popular right now. You can go to all these healing things and all this and all that. And all that. Man, it's craziness out there. But to walk out in humble obedience, can you do that? Look at what God did, though. Let me look at this. <coughs> Verse 15, it says, Then Naaman and his whole company went back to the name of God, stood before him and declared, I know there's no God. Except the whole world except in Israel. Therefore, please accept the gift. Now, but Elijah said, As the Lord lives, I stand before him. I will not accept him. Naaman urged him to accept it, but he refused. Then 17. Naaman responded, Please let two mule loads of dirt be given to your servant. For your servant will no longer offer a burnt sac offering or sacrifice to any other God but Yahweh. See, through this healing, Naaman gave his heart to Christ. Gave <coughs> his heart to God and Christ was coming. But he got saved. He got saved because of the healing. And, and he was bold. He had influence. So he told other people. Everybody that was with him saw what <coughs> God did. And they responded. See, the healing that, that he has in your life isn't for you. God. And we wonder why God doesn't heal this and he doesn't heal that. And we struggle with this and we struggle with that. Because what if 
God's glory is through your suffering. You just have to humbly obey and walk through this. Are you okay with that? You know, how many people got saved because Naaman obeyed? How many lives are going to change if you just humbly obey? I know if you just humbly obey, I know one life that will change. Yours. <laughs> Said you want a different life. If you humbly obey the commands of God, your life is going to be different. Naaman was a leper. Our out of the attic. Our out of the leper. Humbly obey the commands of God. Walk in the ways of the Lord. Humbly obey. <laughs> Are we willing to let ourselves go for the glory of God? Let go of the big picture, the grandiose. Let go of the, the grandiose of things. Let go of the, the big stacks of money. Let go of, of your idea of what God is doing. And listen. All humbly obey. All humbly walk with God who was beaten to stone and, and shipwrecked it and suffered. But his life was different, wasn't it? Do you want your life to be different? While they're singing the song, if you want to come up, the altars are open. Um, you can come up and pray with me. Um, if you don't know God, then you can't obey God. If you want to give your life to Christ, I urge you to do that. So you can start this healing process of enduring obedience.